let's talk about carbon. And what happens after we take a bunch of carbon that's in the ground and put it into the air? Like, way after. Like, into the next ice age after. Sorry, wait. I've been reading The uh, the Life and Death of Planet Earth by Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee. Uh, it's about the eventual fate of the Earth. Plot twist. Everybody dies. Uh, anyway, carbon is a frequent topic of the book. So, the coming ice age slash end of the world. Yes. But before I get into that, I need to cover a crucial component about how life operates here on Earth. Uh, I'm talking about the carbon cycle, uh, which describes how carbon moves around the planet. You've heard of carbon, right? Carbon is one of the most abundant elements in the universe. It is the second most abundant element in the human body. It is found in all life on Earth. Like this plant, this tree, this river, this arm. Point is, it's everywhere. It's a fundamental component of the entire universe. And on Earth, it moves around in what's called the carbon cycle. Uh, a giant global conveyor belt that acts as a kind of support system uh, for all life on Earth and as a thermostat for the average global temperature of the planet. And uh, just like the thermostat at your grandparents' house, you're not allowed to touch it. In this carbon cycle, carbon is exchanged between these vast reservoirs of carbon storage. The first of these reservoirs? The atmosphere. This is where carbon dioxide participates in that heat-trapping greenhouse effect you've been hearing all about which is where the Earth gets its global average temperature from, from the levels of CO2 in the air. The more CO2 there is in the air, the more heat that's trapped. Number two, biology. All the raccoons, slugs, elm trees, orangutans, David tenants, regular tenants, jalapeno peppers, nudibrachs, and lighthouse keepers, everything that is alive and dead, basically. All combined, this counts as a carbon reservoir. Plants take carbon dioxide literally out of the air and infuse the carbon directly into itself. It's quite a trick. Animals who need carbon. Hey, I need carbon sometimes. Come along and eat the plants in order to get it. From there, it goes back into the air or decomposes into the soil. Number three, the ocean. Carbon dissolves from the air into the ocean. Sometimes it goes back and forth between the water and the air. Some might call this indecision, but that's just carbon in carbon. The animals and plants in the oceans are also involved. And carbon settles down in the deep oceans as well for long periods of time. Number four, the geosphere. Ah, the geosphere. It rocks. Basically, this reservoir holds the most carbon. And there's a whole sub-cycle to this part of the larger cycle, too. Rain and plants break down rocks sending key ingredients, calcium, magnesium, bicarbonate, weathered from silicate rocks and washes them down to the ocean. When these ingredients get down to the ocean, they combine and become incorporated into the seashells and bodies of marine organisms. When those creatures die, they get buried and over time form carbonate rock like limestone or shale. As the molten mantle churns and the tectonic plates drift, carbonate rocks are chewed up in the process thus releasing CO2 from carbonate rocks from volcanoes, subduction zones, and mid-ocean ridges. And CO2 in the mantle left over from the formation of the Earth is also released through these processes. You see? A cycle. Carbon is sequestered geologically in other ways, too, like the burial of organic decomposing carbon that, with millions of years of pressure, can go on to form oil. But geologic activity can release that, too. A relatively stable temperature is maintained by moving the carbon around so that only some of it is in the atmosphere during any given span of time. If all of the Earth's carbon collected in the atmosphere, for example, instead of being separated into the different reservoirs, well, let's just say you'd have a bad time. We'd basically be Venus, where the global temperature is something like 800 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. No bueno. So of course we're messing with this cycle by digging up hundreds of billions of tons of carbon out of the ground and putting it into the air. We know that this activity is gambling with the apparatus of human civilization and the stability of ecosystems all over the planet, but what does it mean for the long-term carbon cycle? And what about that coming ice age I mentioned? The relatively recent swings of ice age that the Earth has been experiencing over the last 2.5 million years are indeed related to levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
but they are also related to long-term variations in the Earth's wobble on its axis, to the long-term variation of distance from the Sun in the Earth's orbit of that Sun, and it is related, importantly, to plate tectonics, specifically the arrangement of continents over time. Hold on. Uh-uh. This doesn't negate the role of CO2 in trapping heat in the atmosphere. Carbon is the central component of how the Earth's global average temperature works. These other variables, orbit, wobble, and plate tectonics, these are just bridesmaids. Carbon is the bride here. These variations produce ripple effects throughout the carbon cycle that could take many years to play out. A crucial component in all of this are the feedback mechanisms of the carbon cycle. You know what a feedback mechanism is, right? It's like when you're eating pie, and you keep eating pie until you're full. But how do you know you're full? Simple. Your body tells you. Your body gives you feedback. Otherwise, you'd be more pie than human. The carbon cycle has similar mechanisms. For example, the more carbon there is in the atmosphere, the hotter the planet gets, and the more carbonic acid winds up in the rain, too. And the hotter the planet gets, the crazier the storms, the more rain we get, and thus the more weathering of the landscape and rocks we see. And the more weathering there is, the faster that carbonate rocks are produced. And carbonate rock formation is one of the ways that carbon is captured. It's a feedback loop that is somewhat ironic, because the more carbon we emit, the faster it will be sequestered. And as carbon is pulled out of the atmosphere, the resulting cooler temperatures can trigger other feedback mechanisms and changes that can slow the carbon cycle down further, reducing a once warming world to a starkly cold one. The productivity of phytoplankton, the fact that there are continents near enough to the North Pole to form lots of land ice instead of sea ice, which makes a difference in how much fresh water is moving around, those other bridesmaids I mentioned earlier, these different feedback mechanisms, once a tipping point is reached, can work to drastically change the average global temperature of our world. Does that mean we're okay? That we can admit as much carbon as we want into the atmosphere and that some mysterious feedback mechanism will take care of things for us? No. First of all, there's a natural delay in these feedback mechanisms. Sometimes it takes thousands, even millions of years for them to play out. And second, we are the wild card in all of this. And this is why I've been thinking about ice ages, because the next ice age is inevitable. It's only a matter of time, specifically sometime in the next few thousand years. Keep your calendars open. Our human-caused warming of the planet is only delaying it for now, but it's coming. And maybe the severity of that coming ice age is directly related to our fossil fuel obsession now. Like a snake swallowing a pig, when all this extra carbon reaches that part of the cycle, the reaction could be equally as extra, equally as unbalanced as the warming we are creating for ourselves now. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Maybe so. Maybe not. There are a lot of variables to account for, which is even more reason for us to be cautious about emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, because we're gambling with the survival of human societies, not just in the here and now, but in the future as well. If a warming planet can destabilize human civilization, affecting crop growth, growing seasons, how we produce energy, affecting cities and nations all over the planet, if that's a concern from rising CO2 levels now, then know that an ice age, especially a severe one influenced by us, will absolutely grind the gears of human civilization to a complete stop. Maybe all this carbon emitting we're doing now, maybe we learn some lessons in the long run from this. Maybe we are learning now how to terraform a world, and we take those lessons to Mars and beyond. And maybe in the future we will emit carbon on purpose to reduce the severity of a future ice age. Maybe. Intentionally terraforming a world is extremely difficult, and it is currently beyond our capabilities. So, isn't it just easier for us to stop sabotaging the whole thing to begin with? Instead of hoping that our descendants will somehow magically be able to solve our problems? I think so. Of our options here, I think that reducing CO2 levels in the here and now is the only morally good choice we have to make. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be making out my will. <laughs>